Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Meet the Expert video where we are talking with uh, Joshua Abel. He is one of our nonprofit attorneys, and you are in the comments all the time. <laughs> so I thank you for that. Yeah, um, I love I love helping people. That's great. Yeah. And so let's just dive right in and you know, tell us a, a little bit about your experience as a nonprofit attorney. Yeah, yeah. So I've been a lawyer for almost 20 years. And the first decade of my legal career, I was at a, a nonprofit legal aid clinic that provided free legal services for low income people. And my last five years there, so I was there for 10 years, the last half of my time there, I was the executive director. And so I came in after the founder who she had spent 15 years starting it and growing it. And, you know, when I took over, we, we had about a million dollar annual revenue and a million dollar annual budget. And then by the time I left, we had a $2 million annual budget. So we, you know, doubled in the five time, five years that I was executive director. And it was, and I, it was great to follow the founder because I learned so much from her about nonprofit management and fundraising and working with the board of directors and, and, and kind of, you know, everything, Alicia, that you really are really, really good at encouraging people how to, how to just do all those really important things. And, and, and so I, I worked for her under her direction until I took over. And then kind of after I had been at the legal clinic for about 10 years, I kind of thought, oh, I, 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 I was kind of getting a niche to do something a little bit different in my career, but I wasn't exactly sure what. Up till then, the only legal career that I had was was at the legal clinic. So I was helping individuals with bankruptcies, expungements, family law issues, you know, things that things that a typical nonprofit legal clinic handles. And then I had an opportunity to go to a, a large law firm and but in their nonprofit practice group. So I I then transitioned, went to the went to the private practice side of, of law and spent five years at a, at a really large law firm. But that's where I really learned what it meant to be a nonprofit attorney, to advise nonprofit clients on everything from formation issues to governance issues to donation issues, and then also employment issues. I mean, really any kind of legal aspect that a nonprofit would have. And then I made another switch five years ago. And so now I'm in-house counsel at a grant maker. And so I, during the day, I uh, work at a an organization that awards grants, place-based grants in the city that we're in. And so I'm, I'm in-house counsel and wear a couple different hats. And then a year ago, as a side hustle, I started this boutique law firm where I have clients that are nonprofits, but I also, through quicknonprofit.com, I also help individuals start a nonprofit with the nonprofit formation and seeking 501c3 status. So that's been a little bit of my kind of career trajectory. I love the nonprofit space. I, I think it's really the area where um, people can have a profound difference in their communities. And so I love working with, with people who are trying to make the world better. Yeah. So I'll ask you what makes you different from other attorneys, but from listening to you, it sounds like you just have a, a very broad legal base to, to draw from, but what, what would you say makes you different? Yeah, I, I certainly within the nonprofit space. I mean, it's, it's, you, you don't, you know, there are a lot of attorneys that practice nonprofit law to begin with. And then, you know, in that space, you know, the fact that I've run a nonprofit and I've served on lots of boards and, um, and I, I now work at a grant maker. I mean, I've kind of seen all sorts of sides of, of, of a nonprofit from the legal issues that they face. And so, so I guess that's what makes me a little different. And, and then I will also say, I think for when I started Quick Nonprofit, my, my goal was to be really transparent about different packages, different prices, because lawyers can be expensive. And so I thought, you know, I just want to create three different packages that tells people, here's what I'm going to get, here's how much it's going to cost. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want people to be surprised by any kind of legal bill or anything like that. And so I try to try to be very affordable about it from that perspective as well. Well, since you mentioned it, you might as well tell us what what are the packages and the prices? 
Oh yeah, sure. So I have three different packages. The, the most basic package I call the essentials package. And that's where we do nonprofit incorporation. We get your EIN and then we do your 501c3 status. Assuming you're going to do the 1023 easy, which we can get into as kind of one of the, one of the FAQs that we'll talk about, but assuming you're going to do the 1023 easy, that basic package is 795 plus the filing fees. A next, my next package up offers a suite of government. So it does all that. Plus I give governance documents, including bylaws and an annual compliance checklist okay. and 30 minute legal consultation with me after we've already started kind of all these packages, you get an initial consultation with me. That package is 1295. And then the top package also includes donor issues, including charitable solicitation registration in one state. And that package is 1795. So, excuse me, 1595. So, yeah. So, those are my three packages. Yeah. Well, they do sound reasonable too, which is because I, I see people who aren't even attorneys who are like, you know, $10,000. <laughs> it's like, yeah. seriously. <laughs> yeah. Right. It just doesn't make any sense for sure. Right. Yeah. So, let's see. Let's let's talk a little bit now, change gears and talk a little bit about what the audience, I think, probably really wants to know. <laughs> so can you tell us about the start a nonprofit process? What does that look like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And let me say, too, like um, people do not you do not need to hire a lawyer or an accountant or anyone to do to do this like this is. You, people can do this on their own. So, so although I offer services, it's really for the individual who says, you know what, I, I, I'd rather just have someone do this for me, which is great. But I'm also, I also love to give this information out. And when people go to my website and sign up for my newsletter, my newsletter walks them through how to do all of this on their own. So if they're, if they're wanting to do this without hiring someone, then for my newsletter, I'd love to, to just walk you through the steps. But in a nutshell, you first have to incorporate as a nonprofit in one of the 50 states. Obviously, if where, where you live, you know, if, if that usually makes the most sense where the founder lives, but not always, but you'll incorporate in one of the 50 states as a nonprofit corporation. Typically, at, at the incorporation level, most states require a minimum of three members of the board of directors. So typically, you have that in place at the time of incorporation. And incorporation is really a paperwork process. You file with typically the Secretary of State. Usually it's there, there are online forms that you can fill out. Every state's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are a couple provisions that you have to make sure you put in to the nonprofit incorporation paperwork that will become important when you apply to the IRS. But that's the kind of next step. Uh, the first step is just a state level where you're applying as a nonprofit corporation. Okay. You then get your EIN from the IRS, which is happens very quickly as long as someone has a social security number. If you don't have a social security number, it takes a little bit longer, but that's a, a quick process. And then you apply to the IRS for your 501c3 status. And there are two different applications. One is known as the 1023 easy. One is known as what we call the long form or the regular 1023. And, and there's a difference and there, there's, there are different requirements about what form you can, but essentially that's it. Like that's the, once you do that, once you incorporate at the state level, get your EIN and then get your C3 status from the IRS, you're a 501c3 nonprofit and you're up and running. And then the issue becomes governance, program administration, volunteer management, kind of all those other issues that come with, with running a nonprofit. Right. Okay. Let's see what else. So what is the first thing aspiring founders need to know about the legal aspects of starting a nonprofit? Yeah. Uh, the, so first you have to decide to, you know, what state you're going to incorporate in. Again, for most people, that's a pretty easy question, but I, I have quite a few international clients that they don't care what state they incorporate in because they're, they're running their program overseas, but they want a, a U.S. based 501c3. Mm -hmm. And so, so there can be an issue about kind of what state makes the most sense. And in that kind of, in that scenario, we, we look to states that have kind of low regulation because it's just easier to, to remain in compliance. Right. And, and just, you know, states like that are, are Texas, 
Indiana, where where I'm where I live and, and licensed, has a, a really great nonprofit law. Alabama has a good good process in place. So there are several there are several states that right. that, that the the requirements are pretty easy to to comply with. The next decision, and this is probably the one that I get the most questions on, is how to know whether someone can complete the 1023 easy or the long form. And so I'll just kind of like unpack that a little bit. Okay. But but first let me say the the both forms have have pros and there are pros and cons to both forms. Right. The easy form is substantially easier than the long form. It, it, it takes significantly less time to complete it. The filing fee is cheaper. The filing fee is $275 to the IRS versus $600 for the filing fee for the long form. But the biggest difference is that the response you get from the IRS is much faster. So when you file an easy, you get the response. The IRS will respond and give you your C3 status. Mm-hmm. usually within about three to six weeks, sometimes a little bit longer. Sometimes it's four to eight weeks, but it's usually about three to six weeks. Whereas the long form, it's typically like 10 to 14 months to get a response from the IRS. So, so there's a huge, huge difference. So usually when I tell people that they're like, well, I, I want to do the easy form then. Like, I don't want to wait, you know, 10 to 14 months if I only have to wait, you know, four weeks. And I steer a lot of people to the easy form because I, the it's easy, and I I, I think it, for a lot of my clients it's 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 what they need. However, a couple of things to keep in mind. So first, you have to in order to complete the easy form, a nonprofit has to be able to reasonably say that they believe the income that they will their gross receipts that they will bring in. So that's all revenue sources, grants, donations, you know, whatever they might have revenue from. All of that will be no more than $50,000 during each of their first three years. And so, you know, the, that always leads to the question, well, what if in my second year I end up, you know, getting $75,000 or we get a big grant of $100,000 that I wasn't expecting, which is a great question. So what I tell them is I say, well, there's no, um, there's no prohibition to earning more than $50,000. So if you complete the easy form, you're not prohibited from earning more than $50,000. The IRS knows that you don't have a crystal ball. You can't look perfectly into the future. And all they're wanting to do when you complete the easy form is to reasonably project what your future income might be during each of the next three years. Mm-hmm. And if you were more successful in fundraising than you anticipated, that is a great problem to have. The risk is that the IRS may follow up with a letter. They may want a little more information from you to say, hey, we, you know, we once you filed your 990, your tax return, you know, we saw that you earned more than $50,000 the first year. We just want to know why you thought you were only going to earn $50,000 or less. And, you know, the IRS could follow up to find out, like, they want to make sure you weren't committing fraud when you completed the easy form. But as long as you say, no, we we were more successful than I thought we were going to be, I wasn't expecting this, then it really won't be a problem. The IRS may want you to complete the long form at that point, but that's fine. Like, and if you need to hire an accountant to complete the long form because you don't want to mess with it, Great, you've earned over fifty thousand dollars. You've got money in the bank, so you can do it. So, right. So there's, I, I guess that's the, the big thing is that people there's not a a, a prohibition to earning more than fifty thousand dollars. But that being said, if you if you're going into it and you already know, oh, in my first or second or third year, we're definitely going to have over fifty thousand dollars. I, you know, if you have a funder who's waiting in the wings has, and has already told you. Hey, Alicia, as soon as you get your 501c3 status, we're going to give you a grant for $75,000 because we love what you do and we're behind you. Like in that case, no, you can't do the easy form. You've got to do the long form. Right. In my experience, too, I mean, $50,000, a new nonprofit is not going to make that in the first three years. I agree. I mean, I, it's, I have a lot of clients who are really hopeful and they're like, Oh, I'm sure I'll, I'm sure I'll earn more than $50,000 in my first three years. And I, I hope that they do. 
but it takes a lot of work to 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 raise that money, especially if you're new to the space and new to right. raising money. And so I think for a lot of people, the the easy form makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Now I will say this: the one of the benefits of the long form is that it really in some ways it acts as a business plan. It forces you to put together a business plan for your nonprofit by the questions it asks. You have to put together um, a, a, a statement of revenue and expenses over the next three years. So you've got to, you've got to like line by line for the long form, you've got to project how much revenue you 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 think you're going to earn, what your expenses will be. You've got to answer questions about your board, about your program, about your operations. There are a lot of questions in the long form that, you know, for someone who's brand new to the nonprofit space, and if they've got time, then the it may make sense to complete the long form just because the process of completing it will force them to go through the kind of checks and balances in a way that they can be really thoughtful and deliberate in a way that the short form, the easy form, doesn't give them that opportunity. So that, you know, that's something to think about too. Right. Yeah. And this group also has a a one-page planner that actually walks you through all the different steps. Yeah. So if you wanted to do the easy and then do the planner, I would, you know, certainly suggest doing the planner because it it goes through all the different pieces of of a nonprofit. Yeah, yeah. And you know me. That's terrific. Yeah, yeah, because I'm it, big on one of my fears, yeah, yeah, one of my fears is that people who do the easy form, but they do it on their own, they won't know. Like, you know, I counsel my clients. I'm like, he, you know, here's some things you got to be mindful of. If they do the compliance list for me, you know, I feel pretty confident that they're, they're going to be able to, to, to do everything they need to do. But so for people who are doing it themselves, please go to the Nonprofit Founders Club site, get that, get that one pager and go through it to help you make sure you're, you know, going in the right direction. Yeah. In how to start a nonprofit in the guides, there's actually the the one page planner and a video on how, uh, walking you through how to, what you need to be thinking about in each of the little things. So perfect. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Let's see. And then, so let's talk about some of the, the questions that we got in from the, yeah. the group. So the first question was, how important is the wording and the formality of the board meetings? What is the best way to structure the original board if I will receive uh, pay the first year? And then this was a long one. <laughs> so let's let's break it down and, and talk about that. And then we'll come back to the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let me do the um, board meeting one because that's an easy question to answer. Um, okay. I, I say easy, but there there are different opinions on it. So the when you're crafting board minutes, I kind of think about two different things. One, you want to give enough information that the board members will use it to help remember what they talked about. You know at you know, a year ago or two years ago or next month when they meet, enough information that they can kind of know, okay, here, here are the decisions we made, here's what we talked about, here were the issues that we discussed. But you don't want them so long that they're, a, they're too complex to write, it takes too long, it t- no one's going to read them if they're too long. And so, so there, it's really kind of a, a, an art to how much information you put in there. As far as formality goes, I mean, I've, I've served on boards where, you know, they're very formal minutes. They, they, they refer to everyone as Mr. and Ms. And, you know, the, the resolutions say whereas and wherefore and all of that. That's fine, but it's not necessary. So I, for my clients, I give them, if, if, if they do my second or my third package, I give them sample minutes. And I, I provide sample minutes in two forms. One is a paragraph form, and then one is a bullet list. So I, I kind of say, hey, if, like, here's the paragraph form, and, and I do language pretty informally. Like, it's it's all written out, but I, I don't call people Mr. and Mrs. I don't go through all these 
Whereas, you know, I just, right. I just make it very basic. I just say, you know, who was at the meeting? Was quorum established? What date happened? You know, how, kind of how did the discussion go and what decisions were made? And that's, that's pretty much it. And you can either do that in a paragraph format or it's fine if you do it in bullet list. I mean, that's, that's fine. Though I will say the, one of the purposes of minutes is like, uh, there's a compliance piece. Like you never really have to turn the minutes in mm -hmm. unless you get audited by the IRS or the state attorney general, which is rare, but it can happen. So, you know, if, if, if a regulator wants to, to kind of see what happens, you need to provide those minutes. And so again, the form, they, they don't care about the form. They just want to be able to put together what happened at a meeting, what decisions were made, who was there, when the meetings Right. Kind of yeah. So, yeah. I don't know if you have other thoughts, uh, Alicia, about board minutes. Oh, well, I was just saying, you need enough information that you can go back to sometime later, and enough information that if someone outside the organization came to you and said, "I'm not so sure about this decision," maybe there's a conflict of interest issue in there. Yep. You need enough yep. information to be able to say, well, this is what happened. Yep, for sure. Yeah, that's a great, yeah, great example. You want to think through like, oh, if someone questions this, is there going to be enough information? So like on a conflict of interest issue, I always put in my minutes, you know, so-and-so disclosed the conflict and then stepped out of the room while the rest of the board discussed it. And here's what the board decided. Yeah, yeah, really great. Right. Yeah. On that, so there, the, the next question was about kind of, it sounded like a, a person who's a founder and will get paid as the executive director, I'm assuming, and I think whether or not that person should be on the board. Was that the question, basically? Um, yeah, the best way to structure the original board if she wants to receive pay the first year. So yeah. that would mean, uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I would, you know, there's no, there's, there's no, I think the best scenario, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't how you have to do it, but I think the best scenario, especially if someone is going to get paid as the executive director, I think that person should not be on the board as a director because the executive director reports to the board, the board can hire and fire the executive director. And so I think the, the cleanest arrangement is where, if someone is going to be the, the paid executive director, I think, in my opinion, he or she should not be a board member. Of course, they're going to go to board meetings. They'll have to step out if there's an executive session of the board meeting. They're going to, you know, that person will work very closely with the board, but I don't think that person should be a board member. But that being said, there's no legal prohibition against that person being a board member. So, so he or she could be on the board. And I certainly... There are lots of nonprofits where where the CEO or the executive director does have a board role or a seat on the board, but I think I think a best the best practice is is for the exec, paid executive director to not be on the board. I, and I agree. I don't know if you agree, Alicia. You agree. I do. Yeah. I agree because yeah. I just I see so many conflicts of interest that can happen. Yeah. And. It's like Congress voting their own salary increases, you know, right? because yeah. if you're a board member, that's one of the things that you would be doing is voting bonuses and salary increases for the executive director. And that just doesn't feel right to me. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think you're right. The, when I was at the legal aid clinic, the, the person who was the executive director before me, as I said earlier, she founded the organization. The first couple of years, it was all volunteers. There were no staff. And during that time, she was on the board. When we got to the point where we raised money to hire her as our first staff member, as the executive director, she stepped off the board, became the paid executive director, and then, you know, worked with the board. But she was no longer in a board role when she was the paid executive director, which I think made, I think it worked perfectly. I think that was a good way to do it. Right. And I know there's a lot of founders out there that that are get worried that they're going to lose control if they're not on the board. And but the thing is, if you have a great working relationship with the board and you've got to make sure that you put the effort in to to do that, 
you don't have any problems. Yeah, no, you're right. I, I, I rarely see that kind of problem. Now, I will say sometimes if, if, if someone's, you know, if I'm doing a consultation and, and someone's really concerned about they're wanting that control, mm -hmm. that's when I tell them, I'm like, Hey, like a, a nonprofit is owned by the community. Like it's not yours. Like it's, there is an element where you do have to give up control. Like the board is in place to to and to carry on the mission beyond you, and that's one of the beautiful things about a nonprofit. And so I tell them, look, if if you're really looking for something that you can control forever, then you need to create a for-profit business and not not go. Um, you have to be willing to kind of have a little bit of in your hand a little bit and. and let this go so that it can continue beyond you um, and have have a mission beyond you. And that's one of the beautiful aspects of a nonprofit. But to your earlier point, if for someone who's really doing the work and is committed to the mission, like you don't see that it happens really rarely where the board and the executive director just go sideways. Right. I mean, yeah. So. Yeah, that that's a, a very common question that I I, I see. And it's just, you know, they get, there are consultants out there that fear monger and talk about how you're, you know, you can be kicked off your own nonprofit. You know, you can get, you can get kicked out. Yeah. And, and I see that so yeah. much. So I'm glad that you addressed that because that, that is a question I, I see a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So back to this person's question, I think she starts talk asking about what to call them. You know, is it president, executive board directors? So can you talk about maybe the structure of a board? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you're going to have a board of directors. So, you, so you've got to have a board like, like I said earlier, almost all states require at least, on a minimum, three people to serve on the board. The board members have what are known as fiduciary duties to the board, to the organization, really fiduciary duties to the community. They're acting, they're essentially the public's eyes and ears to make sure that this nonprofit continues its charitable mission and serves the, serves the, the community. And so they're in a fiduciary role, and so they have a legal obligation to ensure that the organization stays true to its mission, it's compliant with all laws and regulations. And so that's that's known as your board of directors, sometimes called board of trustees, but that's that's your board. And you've got officers, so you typically, and there can be different names, but typically at, at a minimum, we see a president, secretary, those are usually required in, in a state's not code. Um, have a, a lot of nonprofits will this this comes in usually years down the road. Like they may start an advisory board or a young professionals board, where and board isn't really the right. They call them advisory boards or young professional boards, but they're not they're not a board member in the sense that they don't have any legal duties. They don't have any legal fiduciary duties. Rather, they're just kind of another group of advisors, maybe a junior board or kind of a potential board members that may come on the board someday. So I, I think, you know, I, I would say don't complicate things, especially as you're starting out, like get your board in place. You can add board members typically at any time, like board members will roll in or roll off, you know? So if you, if you've got kind of, you know, you have your board in place and then, you know, you're providing services for several months and then you've got a volunteer who's really engaged and start donating and let's say he or she is, this is fine or something that would be really helpful. Well, great. Bring them on your board. Like it, like um, there's no, you, you, you're not stuck with your, like, you, you know, you should, a board can always, is always growing. I, I don't necessarily mean growing in numbers, although it can, but a board is always evolving. Um, the, the people on the board, the issues that they're having to solve as the, as the organization, as the organization evolves, the issues that the board is solving is evolving as well. And so you're going to need different skill sets, different people. So uh, I, I hope that answers the person's question. Yeah. And one thing that I like to do is to have staggering terms. 
so that you don't yeah. have a mass of people rolling off the board and a mass yes, of people exodus. coming. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Nope. That's a great point. Yeah. So, okay. Then we've got one more question. Which is best legal structure, a charitable trust, nonprofit corporation versus an unincorporated association? Is one more beneficial than the other? How does the process of a car don't, okay, no, different question. <laughs> so, so yeah, okay. yeah. along lines of a structure again. Yep, yeah, yeah, nonprofit corporation is the best. The, so you can, so I, I mean, I would guess that 95% of 501c3 organizations are set up as a nonprofit corporation in one of the 50 states. But as this person alluded to, you can be an unincorporated association, or you could also be um, a charitable trust, and you could get C3 status. You can also be an LLC and get C3 status, although that's a little more complex. Um, but the vast majority are, are set up as nonprofit corporations. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because um, every state has a nonprofit corporation code. That, that does a variety of things. One of the things it does is it gives liability protection to the directors. So the directors under their state law already have an element of liability protection. Now, most nonprofits will go ahead and get directors and officers insurance to provide additional insurance to help cover them. But, but your, your nonprofit code already bakes in that liability protection. The nonprofit code in your state also has different provisions about about meetings and about, you know, especially if things aren't addressing by corporations versus, you know, trusts or unincorporated associations, vendors are going to be used to dealing with nonprofit corporations. So for a variety of reasons, a nonprofit corporation is the way to go on the setup phase. Okay. And in the how-to group, there is a guide that runs through and talks about all the different ways you can incorporate and gives you a little bit of information so they can look at that too. All right. Awesome. Uh, another right. question uh, from the audience. How does the process of a car donation or property donation work as a nonprofit, like the paperwork, things that you uh, have to have or to function, et cetera. Yeah. So if someone donates to your nonprofit and donates a non-cash item, so whether it's a car or, you know, furniture, computer equipment, something like that. So you need to acknowledge the donation. You need to explain what, what the donation was. Do not put a value on it. That is not the nonprofit's job to value the donation. If the donor wants to claim a deduction of more than $500, then it's the donor's responsibility to send to you a, what's, what's called Form 8283, which is an IRS form. And there's a, I think there's a limit, or what the limit is. I think the limit is if, if the donor wants to claim a deduction of more than $1,500, then the donor has to get a, an appraisal and has to get a qualified appraisal. So there's a lot of information on the IRS website. The, and, and I guess this is a plug too for the IRS website. The IRS actually has really, really helpful information explained in really easy to understand language on all sorts of issues. I think their website is stayexempt.org or .gov. I think it's stayexempt.gov. Does that sound right, Alicia? Do you know? I'm looking it up right now. I usually go to irs.gov. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fine too. Yeah, stayexempt.gov is not a website, so don't go there. It looks like it's just just a blank website. But yeah, the irs.gov and go to, there's a charities. If you go to irs.gov at the very top, there's a charities. I think they call it charities and nonprofits or maybe just charities. And they have a wealth of information all about nonprofit life cycle, about donations, about and so all of this information about how to how to how to send receipts for donations, all that the IRS spells out for you. Right. Okay. So another question: Which five hundred one Cs have donation tax deductions? Yep. Yep. 
only 501c3. And so the there are, I think there are like 30 different 501c subsections. So the big ones are 501c3, which are charitable entities. There are also 501c4s, which are typically like civic associations. 501c6s and 501c7s, we also see a lot of. 501c6s are business leagues. 501c7, I forget what those are. So like there are lots of different tax exemptions. They don't owe income tax to the federal government. But only a 501c3 can give a charitable, can give a, only for a 501c3 will a donor get a charitable deduction if they give a donation to a 501c3. And I guess this is also a good plug-in to add. Because of that, the IRS has, has strict requirements about what is considered charitable. And to be, to really Maybe I should have answered your earlier question, Alicia, about, <laughs> hey, what do I want to, what should I do when I'm starting a nonprofit? Really, probably the very first thing, if, if you want to go, you, the, if you want to get your 501c3, you need to make sure that what you're doing is charitable in nature. Because not everything is, right? Like, like yeah. if you want to start a coffee shop, that may not be, that very well may not be charitable in nature. But, you know, if you want to start an animal rescue entity or, or, an organization helping children or education or health, like those are all going to be charitable in nature. But just know that that sometimes that's that's kind of a that's a question that I will consult with my clients is you know I'll make sure that what they're proposing is charitable before we even go forward um, in in the process. So, right. Yeah, and that's a a good point uh, that you make that you know, not everything falls into the charitable co uh, category. Yeah, right. And so, because it's, you know, it's it's a preferred status to get 501c3 status. It's not automatic. So you've got to, you and you, you've you got to be organized for, for charitable purposes. And so that's where, why your, your articles of incorporation have to include certain language. And you also have to be operated for charitable purposes. And so that's why your program needs to, the, the programs and services that you provide need to be charitable in nature. Yeah. Okay, so just a few more questions. These are some frequently asked questions that we get. So the, the first one is, what are the typical challenges faced by nonprofit founders in the start of a, a nonprofit process and how can they be overcome? So what do they no. see at, at first? Yeah, I, I think for a lot of people, the part of one of the big challenges I, I, for a lot of people is just like thinking through who who should be on the board. Like I, I, I get a fair number of people who, who contact me initially and they're like, hey, I, like I just want to start this on my own. And I always tell them, look, you really, you need to put a board together. You need to get other people engage in this mission with you. It's never going to be successful if you don't start to, to bring other people into the fold and cast your vision so that other people can kind of get excited about this with you. So that's kind of a common challenge that, that we talk through. And what now I tell them, hey, like we just need three. Like we, we gotta have three board members. You can be one of the board members, but don't stop at three. Like if we can start with three to kind of get everything up and running, but really you should make it a goal in your first year to, to, you know, get up to five or eight or, you know, kind of like the sweet spot is really seven to 12 board members, I think kind of after an organization is developed and kind of up and running. So, yeah, but you know, you don't need that necessarily out, out of the, out of the gate, but, but so kind of board structure is kind of a common question. Another question that I get, and this is something to be mindful of, is just the compliance piece of maintaining your nonprofit every year. And so, you know, like you, you've got to maintain your nonprofit. Um, and so you've got to make sure you're willing to go the distance. So, or you have a process in place that you've got volunteers or board members who can help you. So, you know, nonprofits have to file a 990 every year with the IRS. If it's not filed for three subsequent years, 
the IRS will automatically revoke your 501c3 status. Most states have filing requirements for nonprofits that are, in most states, it's an annual filing. Yeah. And in some states, like in Indiana, it's due every five years, which is kind of wild, but you've got to remember like, oh, I'm coming up on my five years. You know, so you've got to have a system in place where you can stay on top of these filings because otherwise, you know, your nonprofit status will be revoked for something pretty minor. So you've got to, you've got to have processes in place to, to keep all of this in check. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's all the questions we have. Is there any that you have thought about while we've been talking that maybe you'd like to throw out there? I don't think so. I think I just, I guess it's kind of a parting, parting kind of advice is to just like, I, I really enjoy encouraging people to say, Hey, if you've been dreaming about a nonprofit for a while and you're excited about, you know, expanding this mission to help in your neighborhood or community or world, like go for it. Like there's no better time than now, like get some other people to come alongside you like start dreaming about how you can how you can have a bigger impact for good and put a nonprofit together and start going through the steps. And I mean, I've seen so many nonprofits change so many people's lives. And so I, I just I encourage people like, hey, like, like go do it. And so that's kind of, I guess, my parting parting words of wisdom. Okay. You mentioned earlier a newsletter. How do people get on your newsletter? <laughs> Yeah, they can go to my website, which is quicknonprofit.com. And on that site, uh, it just, I think there's a, link, there's a page that says newsletter, pop in your email address and you'll get my newsletter. And it just walks you through the nonprofit formation status. And I got some other tidbits in there too, that are hope, that's hopefully helpful to people. But that's, and then you can also, if for people who want to schedule a call with me, on that site, there's also a calendar link where they can go onto my calendar, schedule a call with me, and I'm happy to talk to them. Okay. Well, thank you. And thank you for being here and talking to us. And I hope that you have a great week and we'll talk to you again, I'm sure. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Alicia. Thanks for all you do. <laughs>